everybody. It is Cinnamon Cooney, your art Sherpa. And today's a very exciting day because I'm going to show you how you can paint a pond that's clear enough to see the bottom, where there's a waterfall, where there's dynamic reflections, where you have flowers with roots you can see and koi fish swimming in a circle and stones. I mean, it's all the things. And I'm going to show you how simple that actually is to paint when you understand how to break down the steps. I'm going to show you every technique, every color mix, everything you need to know. To help me do that is my husband, John. Hello. He makes sure that you guys can see what I'm doing by having a camera focused on the te technique or zooming in or always being where the painting action is. We have a dedicated palette so you can really see those color mixes. Now, if you don't feel like drawing or sketching out or you want more information, I highly encourage you to check out the link below, which takes you to the website where there is a free step-by-step -step written out mini book that you can download um, and use to paint along with the video to get like the most out of this that you possibly can. If you think, gosh, this is a lot. Well, that's because you've actually come to a, something called Acrylic April, which is a 30 day painting program where I teach people to paint landscape water better. So if you've been interested in painting from trip photos or landscape photos or anything, and you're like, man, water is hard in landscape. This whole month is about that. There's 30 paintings dedicated to that. You could come by and just paint these happy koi and get a great painting and and not come back again. So please come back again. Or you can take place, take part in the full 30 day program. Um, if you think that's really cool that we teach that much free art, be sure and hit the subscribe button during the video. We're going to make you happy. So hit the subscribe button. I know we're going to do a good job. Mm -hmm. um, get your paint, get your brushes, come back and meet me at the easel right now. I'm going to show you how to paint this. So to paint today's gorgeous clay pond, we're going to be using an 8x8 surface. I put a wish or intention that whoever's painting this feels better about the art skills that they're learning today. The paint colors that we're going to be using are Mars Black, Phthalo Green, Burnt Sienna, Ultramarine Blue, Cad Red, Cad Yellow, and Titanium White. It's a very small, limited palette, which will make it a lot of fun for you guys if you have limited colors. John, are you ready to give them a step one? I am. Step one is pretty straightforward. We're going to paint in a colored ground. That's a solid field of color over the whole canvas. We don't have to be worried about how neat it is. It can be a little bit streaky. We're just going to get a basic staining or coloring on this surface. I'm going to take my biggest brush that I have out today, which in this case is my uh, one inch oval mop. You could use a bright. You could just, just get a brush that will paint your surface fairly quickly. This is not a, a brush specific uh, skill. I'm taking a little phthalo green and burnt sienna and I'm mixing them together in a sort of one to one process, which just basically means one part of the phthalo green and one part of the burnt sienna. Now, sometimes I get questions um, from the viewing peoples, you guys. Sometimes you guys send me questions and your question is how much is one part? Well, one part is an ever-changing measurement because you decide what one part is, right? If you were going to use one cup of paint of green, you would use one cup of burnt sienna. But if you were going to use one tablespoon of green, you would use one tablespoon of burnt sienna. Don't use either of those amounts. Those are too much. <laughs> but the point is, whatever you're loading into your brush, guesstimate, your best estimate, what would be about the same for each, an equal amount. For both to get this green. One part phthalo green, one part burnt sienna, equal amounts. And you brush that out. The brush strokes and directionality, none of that is really that important for the stage. This is really just about getting this solid green there. You're going to want to dry it, and then I'm going to come in and show you how to sketch in the structural objects of your landscape. The chalking in phase is pretty straightforward, but there are actually several options for you guys at home at this stage. You could use the traceable method. So if you check that description below, it takes you to my website where there's a step-by-step -step mini book, there's a traceable, and there's a grid reference. Any of that is an acceptable way to get the image on the canvas. But if you're drawing along with me at home, I'm gonna show you how I do that. I'm using a chalk 
white pencil. This isn't an oil pencil or grease pencil. It's specifically chalk because I want it to disappear into the paint. And I'm going to come up about a third of the way on my surface. And we're going to draw out what we would think of as a rock structure. Now the rock is peeking out of the water. So we need to have a water line that comes here. Kind of comes around that rock. That's going to be kind of a fun thing to show this rock and some other rocks beneath the surface. Now here in this space, kind of coming in and out, are some wonderful plants. Yeah, that's all we have to do for that. That was fun. That would be easy. <laughs> sure. Just just put them in. And we also have a fun waterfall happening over here and this far shore edge. So we're going to say this is pretty much up in this region of the surface. Let's build a little rock out that comes down like this. It peeks out into the water. And it'll have a nice little reflection. That's going to be great for us to practice our reflections. I'm going to bring this rock forward. Comes up a bit. And maybe over from the corner. Right. But it has some interesting uh, elements to its face. So we want to definitely sketch that. And we've also sketched in how it's going to come down the fall. This is a little bit, if you're doing the whole 30-day painting program with us, mm -hmm. um, this will be very familiar to you from previous lessons. This is where we're putting a whole bunch of things together that we've already sort of done. I'm going to bring a distant rock back here. And it will have a kind of big boy blocking its way. I like that when they, when they layer into each other a bit like this. Yeah. It's fun to me dark little rock going like that. This one will come over from the side. It is up into the landscape and comes down into the fall. Those two go together like this a bit because there's a fall that comes between them. The big round rock will be right here. And then at the base is a bit of a mossy rock that will be wet. And this will allow the fall to essentially come between these two here. It's also coming down here and kind of running that way. There's a bit of a kerfuffle there and it runs down here. And there's a little peak of it that runs down here. And off to the side here, coming sort of at an angle and it's going to be covered by some of the reeds is another nice little structural landscaping boulder that some nice gardener or nature put in, hmm. depending on how you're wanting to think of this. So there's some objects behind the reeds, even though they're coming in here and will be peeking out. We also have some rocks under the surface. We know we've got a little circle of fish that are going to be going like this, right? which is sort of fun, a little swirl. And they do do this, by the way. And then there's some wonderful rocks under the surface that we're going to be implying and hinting at here, too. And I will talk about those with my value. And then we have some great reflections. So we're going to be dealing with the running water. We're going to be dealing with the rocks that we learned. We're going to be dealing with rippled reflections, uh, still reflections, light through reeds. Wow. Um, just really kind of like, if you consider this as kind of like uh, like the chapter, like we're covering, like we covered all those skills. Now here they are all together in one painting, like transparency, everything. Just all the things in this fun, simple painting. So when you're looking at an, a landscape like this, it can be kind of mentally challenging because there are these depths of transparency to the bottom of the pond. And you might be asking yourself, well, how would I paint that? Now, if you are asking yourself that and you haven't done the rest of the paintings in the 30 part series, I highly recommend that you do that because we answer those questions uh, in segments. But mm -hmm. here we are and we're looking and we've got the depth of the stones and we can kind of think of it in the way that I got talked to you guys a lot about distant sky being far away. And so we want to paint those far away things first. We're going to paint our deepest objects in here first and our far away deep values, kind of blocking that all in. And that's going to allow us through layering of objects, create a sense of space. So like we'll go the deep shadows in the pond and then we'll have reflections, we'll have fish and then reflections 
And then the world around it, it creates that sense of space and scale. I'm going to take a number six round. This is a Cambridge, which means it's a hog bristle brush. Um, this brand can be hard to find. But what you're looking for is a hog round that comes to a nice point when it's wet. And we're going to kind of loosely sketch this in. Now, I talked to you guys a lot about how I can take black and yellow and make an interesting green. Mm -hmm. But believe it or not, we're going to be doing that a lot. It's going to be fun for the bottom of the pond. So where I want it to be quite dark, I'm going to come along here and add a shadow of what is going around the rocks. These shadows that we see in the distant water mm -hmm. will be what implies shelves or spaces that maybe are really blocking the light. Even if we're going to create a lot of reflection over it, it's still a very good idea to kind of capture that value. So that's what we're going to do right now. Where there are deep shadows, they're kind of green, but where there are deep shadows, we're going to put those in. Now, even coming around here, even though I know I'm going to have a lot of like light reflections, if I come here and add a lot more yellow, I can kind of speak to this very close to the surface green rock. And it, it's real funny because I always run into students who will tell me that they were told to never use black in a landscape. Mm-hmm. I've heard the, that before. Yeah, and it, it, top of the rock. But you're about to, like, be such a convert on that concept because you're going to be like, this makes the best bottom of pond. Sometimes some things just make a good bottom of pond. Mm -hmm. And see, I'm just kind of sketching that in. And it's also really easy for me to go through and find, you know, add to a dark value or come in with a light value. Right? I can come in and, and get very deep in structural spaces like down here in the roots. Yeah. Painting in underneath here is a lot of fun for me. Not to mention that we have a great deal of wonderful stones that I'll be adding. Yeah. So I'm, I really love it. We're, we're getting the big payoff now. And we deserve the big payoff. I think so. I like how the... How much painting the darkness for water creates depth. <laughs> and the light creates motion. It does. The light creates the motion and the darkness creates the depth. Now I've got... I'm going to put a bunch of fish here. But let's, for the purposes of the bottom... Put in kind of a dark base for a second. And then we're going to put in a bunch of highlights real fast. And it really isn't going to take a lot out of us, I promise. When you come in and you add the, hi and the highlights and then the surface highlights, it's going to be amazing how fast this whole world will kind of come together. And you will see how each lesson has led you to this moment. <laughs> they did all tie together. You had a plan. We always have a plan. We often have a plan. Now you'll notice that I'm not being as dark as I might be with some of the shadows. I'm just getting this kind of depth value. When I deepen the the floor of the pond, mm -hmm. it pushes those objects back. Come back and put some black values where I think that they need to, to be the deepest. Black, black. And then as you pull little things up and you reveal the stones at the bottom and then when we put the surface ripples on there, with the fish in the middle, mm -hmm. it'll go, it'll be like that resin guy who does those resin sculptures. Oh, yeah. Not the new one I'm obsessed with, but the, the one with the fish. <laughs> I know who you're talking about. Yeah. I like resin artists. I follow other stuff. That's what I do with my this art. Huh? So that particular artist paints layers of epoxy 
to yes. create three-dimensional forms. And it's really wonderful to see that happen. Also, it's interesting to see how his brain works like a 3D printer. So I have the beginnings of this, but now I can come back with a little bit of my yellow where I want to definitely lighten up and do two lighter stones or spaces in the pond floor. that are perhaps raised up out of the depths. Mm. I haven't even gotten the white involved into it yet. I'm just green, making green from Mars black, had yellow, and that's it. Right now, someone is thinking, I can just paint ponds forever. I have these colors. I know I could. I think I you would actually it. like it. You could watch people paint ponds? Well, you. <laughs> you have I don't know. I don't know that I would like just watching generic people paint. Not that there are generic people, but general people. General people that you're not, like, specifically married to? Specifically, yes. I think that's what makes them generic. <laughs> They're not my brand. They're not your people. <laughs> They're somebody else's people. They're good people, but they're not your people. They're some other tribe of people. This is a really good space to practice creating lighter and darker values. It's almost a monochromatic study. Hmm. Uh, when I did my video on how I paint water, I actually did it in black and white because I wanted you guys to see how... Um, it's not the color, it's not the blue that makes the water. And a lot of this year's lesson is about that. It's not the color. There's a weird kind of darker rock there, but I want to show it definitely in the deep, deep, deep. It'll have a big reflection over it. That's the other thing is you want to generally imply these rocks, but don't get too, like, Precious with it because you're going to put so much reflection over the top. Mm. You don't want to paint the best rock of your life just to be ripple, ripple, ripple. Because we're going to come right over the top and be like ripple, ripple. But you've got to have it underneath there. So in painting philosophy, I find that some artists will just construct a painting from one corner to another. And they just paint almost like a micro printer, like what's in each corner, and they kind of go line out until they get it. A lot of hyper realists work their paintings out that way. Hmm. And you can see, even it, like as I add yellow, it, it, it just stays green, but I can add some defin definite little values that are what? So there are definitely different ways you can construct a painting. So many ways to construct a painting. There's never just one way in. I want a deeper, darker rock. I just add more black. You can see that just pieces in another little darker rock in there. This is how we create the pond floor. Hmm. You got to get your pond scum in there. I think that's also why I titled the video How I Paint Water because, and, and I'll probably do some How to Paint Water videos, but in that one I wanted you guys to understand that that was my specific way of doing it, not the only way of doing it. Hmm. We're going to put some different little shapes here. Really all around, we're going to put pebbles on the forest, on the, not the forest floor, the pond floor. Pond. In the bottom of the pond. And just tap out different values of light and dark here to start to imply a depth of pebble. A depth of pebble. I like that. Some will be big flat pieces, right? But some will be small little pebbles. If you do a bigger rock, you definitely, definitely want to come in and give it 
some kind of shading. Look at that, the pond floor is really just coming out of nowhere, isn't it? it that's one of the things, I, I again, I like about water paintings is they tend to be more like um, watercolor because they develop rather than having kind of like this unfinished existence. Stage. Yeah, the unfinished stage. Yeah, I really, um, I mean, we're going to be on a topic of water for a minute, so I hope everybody likes it. Not just in Acrylic April, but I think in general on the channel. I think there's a lot of interest in water. So I'm going to paint it for a minute. All the waters. So everyone's like, okay, 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 I got water. That can happen. But um, I don't think so. I think there's a lot of, lot of, there's a lot of water to cover. There's so it was real cute. Somebody had once said, I think you painted that sunset before. And I'm like, do you think? And I shared every sunset. And they were all different. It's like, it seems like one has, but yet one has it. I don't think you can paint the same sunset twice. It's really weird. You can paint similar sunsets. They can have some stuff in common, but they just will never be the same sunset twice. It's super fun to kind of get in here and be like, what's here? How can we speak to this forest floor? Mm. Not forest. I don't know why I want to say forest floor. <laughs> well, it was a forest floor at one point. There it's, you go. <laughs> the water settled there, and now it's a pond floor. And you can see I'll come in and add some shadows around rocks. You could say it's the forest basement. Where I've got really distinctive rocks, I will try to add little shadows there. I really like that. I'm feeling darker values where there isn't a specific rock. I'm turning only so that I have a better angle. And also I can see around the glare. Sometimes acrylic paint when it's wet has a glare. Yeah, I've noticed that. You know, and so you want to definitely kind of work around that. This rock has a really interesting kind of little water line. Mm -hmm. So that'll be fun to paint the above and then have the green water line. There we go. And then when you put the little ring of water around, it'll feel so like that rock is below the water. Fun to do. Good fussy. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll add a little highlight in a few places. There we go. I think that's a very nice bottom of the pond. Mm -hmm. We did bottom of the pond. Choo -choo. Bottom of the pond. Choo -choo. Now it's time to go on to the next step. Let's start painting the same sort of blocking in of the outside space. We're going to build the rest of the world. I'm going to take my Mars black and a little of my uh, burnt sienna. I'm going to come from the edge of the pond here and kind of pull up. And I'm using a number eight bright in a hog bristle. I'm choosing this brush because I like its rough bristles and the way that they actually kind of create a texture. I appreciate it. I'm going to continue to add brown into the black. I come around here and create this sort of depth. Really, a lot of this back here is so deep that it's like, well, 
I mean, not deep in concept, just deep in value. <laughs> Bring it's, these things around here. It's a deep here. pond. It's a philosophical pond. Right. We have so many flowers and reeds and everything over here. This isn't where this isn't where I want to put all my energy in the painting. I need to complete it. I just don't want to have all my energy in the painting on it. I could I I can see getting into painting ponds. Can you? They could. They're just metaphors for for life. The soul. Yeah, they really are. You're being cheeky, but they really are. I'm not. I'm thinking like you know. So that kind of like builds that elements. in. Now it'll be the way we layer things that keeps that from being more water that suddenly ran up the canvas. Mm. I'm gonna rinse out and dry off, and start to shape out my rocks. My rocks I'm gonna do with my burnt sienna, and my ultramarine. This makes a really lovely rock gray. I'm super fond of. And you can kind of see it when I get the white in there. So up top here, I'm going to add a little bit of my rock gray, my mid-tone rock gray. Maybe the front of this will have some mid-tone rock gray. In front of him definitely will have some rock gray. That seems good. Rock gray being a great color. I can add more white if I want to do, say, the top of a rock. I don't know. You don't know? I don't know. I'm getting those. You're just like thinking of all the songs now that you're. Cascading. Are you back to the rock songs? Now, if, back to rocks. rocks. Where the gray is going to start coming near the pond, I might get some of this a slight green cast into it from what I made earlier. Yeah. And that's where it's going to be kind of around this. A little darker. And let the top lighter. You can always sort of speak to like maybe a little edge here that's mm. pushed out before it goes into the water. Doing a rock. Just paint that rock in. Paint a rock in. That's all you're doing. Paint a rock. That's what you're trying to do. Paint your rock. Let's see my little gray here. A rock. Top of this rock. And it's okay that it's sort of rough because, again, we're roughing it in. Your rock should be rough. Unless it's been... Tumbled? Or smoothed by the river. River can smooth your stones. The river cannot smooth my stones. I'm going to get into a darker color. I'll even add some black into it. Come along here. I had too much white in my brush, though, so I've got to rinse out. So a lot of times when you're painting, you really want to pay attention to those values. The values are where a lot of this is happening for you. And if you find that you're off in value, it's okay to come back and be like, uh, no, thank you. You need to be more here. And in the back, I may even go more black and blue. where these rocks might feel more in shadow. It's a pretty deep area of the piece. And you can see this is just a very rough brush, so I'm not that worried about it being super perfect or anything. Black and blue, I'll come under this one. And sometimes in this under painting stage, it's almost better to work with a Scruffy brush. It certainly makes me happy. I Helps. relax it because it forces me to work kind of loosely mm -hmm. and think about it in those terms. I can always get back into my white when I need a lighter value. To create some top of rock. As you are. Mm. Mm. 
Now, I think I'm going to want to switch to my number six round in the hog just to get a little more control around the turns. Ooh. <laughs> I didn't realize that the brushes gave control in the turns. Yeah. That's what you were talking about, that uh, arabesque line study stuff? Well, this wouldn't be an arabesque, but no, in a, you would you do have turns in an arabesque face. And that's where you use that round brush for that. Yeah, I, I more prefer like a round, or even an angle can be really fun in an arabesque, because an angle will work like a calligraphy tool. Mm, that's what I was thinking. Calligraphy was the word I was using. You're painting the really deep, deep, deep shadows there, eh? Yeah, I'm catching these dark shadows on the rocks. I'm looking for values. Where the rock is to the earth, it's going to have a deep shadow. You know, and what's interesting, I'll get some more of this gray here. Coming forward. And then we get to get back into our, our fabulous weird green, which is right here. Because a lot of these are, uh, because of the moss, also oh, yeah. green. Now, that doesn't mean that we won't have a brighter green that we get involved as we go. But right now at this stage. Do you want to put those highlights in later? And we can even add a little ultramarine blue to it, which will take it into a deeper green gold. Sometimes we don't think of those objects in that way. I'm going to paint a light rock right here. This is like a puzzle, and I am filling in the puzzle pieces. Get more ultramarine, come down between. It's a pretty powerful color, underestimated color in painting by um, sometimes by artists. Not all artists, just some artists sometimes will underestimate ultramarine because it doesn't mix the bright greens that we expect yeah. the green to mix, and so sometimes we discount it. But really, it's amazing. I think it's rocks. super fun to just get into this. And then I can take my black and blue sometimes and get a little white. I haven't really rinsed. That's the other thing about rocks is I don't rinse my brush as much during rocks because the colors sort of translate super well from one rock to the next rock. Hmm. I'm down here with a little green on the side. Anywhere the rocks could be wet, they will have a bit of a more green aspect to them. I've heard you talk about trying to use the colors um, everywhere where possible. Like if you have a color somewhere in, in a painting, it's good to try to use it elsewhere. It can really make a big difference uh, in your artwork to use a color uh, in more than one location. Sort of brings continuity to it. It deeply does. It, it's, there's a concept in art sometimes called a mother color. And that's a color that you put throughout the painting almost just everywhere, right? Uh -huh. The overall tone of the painting. So then when you use a different color, it, it really stands out. So it's a wonderful way to play with objects. The big thing here is to try to get value. So uh, not the highlights of value, but the darker values. I just rinsed out. I'm going to get some darker value. I'm trying to make sure that these objects... You know, look like they are blocking light. 
We need to block the light. Block the light. I can always get into my brown and even add a little of my white to it. Kind of gives me sort of a weird dirt color. Put that here. Be sure to wipe out any hog brushes that you're using pretty regularly. Why is that? Because they can get soggy. Hmm. Like cereal? Mm-hmm. You got it. Soggy like cereal. You got to keep them fresh. And I'll finish out by taking a little green and brown again, making quite a dark color. And back here, I'll hit it with just a little dark green and brown. My irises, just to be building up green on green on green. Mm. All right. I think we're good on that stage. We built the next layer of rocks. Then we're going to start putting in elements and things that start to create some uh, realness in this world. So let's start to add some personality and color and value and things to these objects to, to give them a little bit more character, All right? Because right now they're a little one-dimensional. Not the, not the water. The water is actually pretty wonderful, though. We may, as we go, even give some to that. But we want to look for places where we can really create some depth and interest. I'm going to take a little of my maybe even black and green and brown some places and get some yellow into that. I find sometimes if I play with different greens that I get a sense of different zones even when I'm painting green on green on green on green, mm. right? which can be a little bit challenging to us as artists is trying to get that green on green on green on green on green. And add a little more yellow right here. Really try to pull a highlight coming in. Maybe across there. I do think I have something to contribute to this dark, dark, dark undertone value. Mm -hmm. And that's that until you see these paintings in person, you don't fully value all of the depth that the paintings have. Because no matter what we do, the cameras can't capture everything. Yeah, it's. A painting in real life is different than a painting in a photograph. Sometimes I'll add brown to my yellow-green mix yeah, just to uh, knock it back. No, it's super true. And it's just to say that the, the binocular vision of our eyes picks up different specular highlights off of brush strokes alone. So there's, there's science. There's like a whole bunch of stuff there that's just different. Did you about... look up the science of it? Well, no, I just like, I've known about this. Like I got interested it's like, in looking. I've known. Well, it we're was adding a, a let, let me just, we're going to be doing a lot of this. So I just, I think this is important what he's saying, oh, no. uh, but I'm going to be alternating between the phthalo green, the burnt sienna, the cad yellow and the Mars black, just kind of trying to alter my greens. I may sometimes get into my ultramarine blue and my titanium white to lighten. So there's going to be a whole bunch of dancing around, and I'm going to be looking for spots where I can lighten. Okay, keep going. Sorry. Well, I mean, I used to think that a photograph was the same as a picture, which is the same as anything, right? Just as long as your color correction is there. But I don't think that anymore. I know that. <laughs> no. After having experienced all types of technology, from cameras to scanners to video uh, I know that the color, the, the imaging device changes and interprets what you're, what it's looking at. Yeah, it really does though, doesn't it? Well, it's a sensor. It can only sense so much, not as much as what our eye does. So it's different than the, re the reproduction device, whether it's a screen or a piece of paper or something else that's been printed on. Just, it didn't. It also interprets. Now I'm going to get into my burnt sienna and my ultramarine and play with some grays as well around the surface. 
Because there's certainly a lot of gray. But Blue. my point, I think. Your what? My point is that these... Did you have a point? <laughs> yes. These deep, deep, dark shadows and values, you can't always see that in the video or the photo, but in the paintings that you do... Oh, you'll be so delighted. Such a difference. I'm engaging and releasing my brush here. And remember, if you're having trouble with any of this, do download the mini book. Do go get those extra resources because sometimes just seeing the step mm -hmm. photographed and still, you can start to take in, oh, well, there's a little gray here, there's a little bit here, and you can duplicate it. You can build up the layers, which is why we do those. If you can see the layers come in then you're, and you're not having to take them in all at once, you can really get a sense of what you're trying to do there. I'm going to get a little of my yellow over here into this. I like to play with the color. Mm -hmm. No, I like what you're saying, though, babe. No, no, I mean, just that was it. That, that you know, that when you're painting these, you know, these paintings, that the the depth of the color and the layers don't always come across in the photos and the videos. But and I'm not even sure that they can. Yeah, you know, no. I, the contrast certainly can. And you, some of the saturation and hue can. Some of it will come through. But a lot of times... You know, a lot of times uh, a painting that maybe looks amazing in a thumbnail isn't going to look great in real life because when you paint it big and you shrink it down, whoa. Like, in fact, when I used to work in uh, print and paper, you would do pieces bigger to, you would you do them much enlarged. So when you shrank them down, the lines look crisper. Everything was cleaner. That was like a trick that we, not like we were tricking anybody, but that was just a thing that you did. Mm-hmm. Gonna add more brown here. So sometimes I'm gonna look for more of a brown value in my grays, and I still want them to be distinctly darker in value because I I want you know my rock to slow forward. Right. And then for sure where it's close to the water, I can take it more into a green. It's always fascinating to me to play with these different color mixes through here. Mm -hmm. Play with your rock color mixes and see what you've got. I'm going to make some kind of rough edges here. I really want to have that rock feel kind of distance. I've, I need some dark values back here, so I'm going to take almost even my green-brown. Get back into my brown and yellow. I wanted to play with this stuff. Because you're really showing all these different um, aspects. Mm -hmm. And then where I need to rinse out every once in a while, I just do. I do. Just make sure you're really uh, drying off your brush. I'm going to sip a little bit of coffee and get back into it. So that's a that's a weird thing, just so you guys know at home. Like, we have the regular interruptions that everyday people have because mm -hmm. we're everyday people. And that's why these just videos tend to be long. <laughs> well, I think they're long because I chat a lot. Let's be honest. They're long because I have a lot to say. We tend to chat a lot, I guess. Well, let's get back into our rocks. So I'm going to keep going in, and it's just about getting the values. This is the Burnt Sienna Ultramarine Blue Gray. I'm going to make a very light value of that. And it's always about just finding 
the different uh, lights and darks in a piece. By coming here and like even making that little detailed edge there, that makes things look a little more rockety. Mm. These rocks have interesting little edges, don't they? They do. And you can do a lot of stuff like sometimes rocks have flex and you can play with those flex if those were of particular interest to you. But right now I think we just want to get the feeling and the sense of the shape of objects. You know, as we're going. Let's add a few more values in here. Like we've got the kind of dark space on the back of that rock. We can take the black and the yellow, which we now know for sure makes a pretty deep landscape green. And again, why I often am like, I don't know what you mean when you can't, you say you can't choose black and landscape. It's a good color for it. I very much like this little forward rock here. I understand the different schools of like chromatic black versus, you know. I don't even know that that's what people mean though, because chromatic black wouldn't make that green. Uh, black is really like almost a blue in the sense of its pigment. And chromatic black is, is really a very neutral gray created by generally uh, a type of hidden primary between See, two colors. That's, that's where that complicated middle ground is. What I mean by like, so it, in the generality of don't use black comes from a sense of not understanding black maybe, because if you understand the bias of black in its colors, then using black is okay, right? Yeah, I, I think so. But That's I mean, my theory, and I'm sticking to it. I'm adding a little bit of this glaze here to kind of imply that that rock is now a little deeper under the water. feel like um, other than locating any little highlights or interesting bits that you might want to play with here, mm -hmm. you know, if you're like, oh, you got a couple spaces where you feel like Picking up some highlights could be of worth to the piece. I think that is really where we want to take those stones. I get to come back and put in the yummy good bits. But for this next step, let's put in some fishies. Fishies, but we need a little plan for our fishies. And if we make the right kind of plan, we can actually make our fishy painting much simpler. So one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to take my chalk pencil and I'm going to make some small fingernail sized little curve lines. Sometimes the lines will be more curved. Sometimes they will be less curved. And I'm going to do a little circle of these. Kind of happening here. You want to make some of them smaller as you're trying to tell the story of this. Is it a shoal of fish, John? You know? A shoal? What is it when they do this little circly up. thing? Um, I thought they were schools. Well, I know it's a school, but like if they do this, doesn't it become something else? Oh, no, I don't know. I think a shoal is like a shallow area of water. That's right. It is. Ah, vocabulary. So we're totally like a STEAM course. <laughs> if I say two and two is four, does that mean I'm like fully official? <laughs> I don't know. Probably not. They probably expect you to be better. So these little curved lines are going to help me really do these fish in short order. It is important to make sure you have short little ones or ones that might be layered over. So I'll show you guys how to do that. But you just want that sense of there are fish going in a circle. Mm -hmm. And I may even kind of take this one out of the center circle, use my finger to remove it. You can remove chalk with just, you know, your finger. That's a good idea. 
when I have those little chalk bits in and we could get a picture of those chalk bits. For the magic of editing, we're back. Now I'm going to take a number four round and I'm going to get my brush wet. And most of these I'm going to make with a mix of my pad red and a little bit of black at first. And the reason I'm doing the combo of these with the black and the cad red is I will come back with some brightness, but I do want the fish to feel like they have different values. So how I make the stroke is I'm going to come in, I press hard, and then I'm going to release. And then I do a little flick at the end there. And come here. I may have to turn this because I can really only curve this stroke one way with confidence. But once I do that, then I can definitely pull the tail over that way. Most of these will be the um, bright orange. You know, I can come back and put little dots on them, but I think it's nice that they're mostly one color. I like to add the little flick of the tail. This makes them some of the most fun fish to paint. Look at the tail. Look at the tail. Look at the tail. Yeah. And you can definitely layer them over each other. Get the sense of the shoal going. Sometimes I will curve that tail back. Fish just do their own thing. Can't even tell you how much. The bigger up closer one. It's like a little comma stroke. This fish will go against the grain. This little fish right here mm -hmm. is going to swim its own way. Swim in his own way. So you can see how um, doing the little comma strokes sort of helped me figure out where I want to put my fish. I feel like. Maybe a little one that's orange here. I'm sorry I'm turning it, guys. No, I know that's right. like a thing. That's just what you gotta do. There. Now, the uh, white fish are weirdly interestingly enough, we're actually gonna do them based off of uh, orange. So, a mix an orange and white. It gives me this weird pinky fishy color that we can build up on. It's almost a, a weird flesh tone is the base of the fish. Mm -hmm. Ooh. So see, I've just layered that fish on top of his friend. Object placement. Curving that back. Oh, he's got a super curved little fin. He's doing a thing.
There we go. So there's a little placement of fish. Um, the white fish right now will be jumping up because they're brighter and lighter and because of contrast, they're going to pull up. As we add highlights and markings and interesting bits to the fish, that will change a little bit. But right now we've got to let that dry. And when we come back, we'll put the highlights on it. So the next thing that we have to do in our art journey of fish in the water is to create a little highlight and sort of finish them out so that they feel uh, more than just a little cute brush stroke that we have in the water. Right, John? Yeah. So onward with the number four round, I'm going to go ahead and load some brighter colors into the mix. Now here we've had, you know, a little of the cad red and cad yellow and some white, but we want to go even more white this time. Hmm. Even. Because we're going to create some bright highlights for these white but not white fish. You can see it's definitely still in that color family, but it's a lot brighter. And come here and make sure that we have highlight maybe like one half the fish. Ooh. There we go. So he's there. We can see him. He seems interesting. But he's not just... We're just trying to show this little belly might be mm -hmm. in shadow. A shadow belly. I'm going to come here and maybe get some more to the face. Get the little fins here. I'm just trying to capture some dimensionality. Mm -hmm. Now, a couple of the uh, other fish might have a few little white markings. Because koi often have these sort of irregular patterning. In fact, we used to have koi at my house. And I can tell you that some koi are worth like a million dollars based on the types of markings that they have in the size of the koi and the shape of the koi and the fin structure of the koi. The business of koi is very serious business. And in the 80s, we had a friend of ours who was a pathologist doctor. And rather than investing in uh, real estate, he had invested in koi. <laughs> the problem with that is, is that sometimes coyotes, come down out of the mountains and eat your koi and he had a hit about two hundred fifty thousand dollars and that's in the 80s of koi that got et that's crazy it was crazy so not a safe investment if you don't protect it from the koi bandits <laughs> but when we knew him we had got some koi for our pond and i got to go to this really cool uh koi specialty grower i don't want to do all the fish i just want to have some of fish some of fish White head there. Um, we got to go to this koi grower, and he let me pick out whatever fish I wanted from the smaller pond, and I got some really beautiful fish. Like he kept his word. I think he got he let me. He let me get nicer fish than I deserved. Mm -hmm. You know, the way people are are nice to little kids. So I'm gonna grab a little of my yellow and red here, and mix it into this space, so it's a bit brighter and lighter. We're going to come in and uh, brighten up our fish. And I can even uh, add, see a red here. So he's white, but I kind of went in the opposite way. Isn't that wild how they become koi real fast? Yeah. With just a few markings. It's because we really just know what these fish are. We're very familiar with ornamental fish. Usually I'm always surprised at how much we know ornamental fish. And it doesn't take much brightness mm -hmm. to really brighten the core. It's okay to have some of them down low be maybe a little bit darker because they're deeper in the water. And that will also help give us some dimensionality to what we're looking at.
I love making them patterned because they coy up real fast. Technical term, coying it up. Just like a little thin off here. Pour it up. Let's give him some bright spots. And so that's what I'm doing. Now I understand I'm turning the surface here, and that can be a little bit wonky. Mm -hmm. um, I do that, and the reason, one of the reasons you want to download the mini book or grab those step by step pictures is so that you can have a stable squared on version of this. I've got to do this so that I'm not turning my head or back to orient for the canvas. Because if you turn your head or back to orient for the canvas, you can really do damage to yourself. Right, I'm going to get a little more orange kind of going. One last little value. Cad red and a little cad yellow. We're going to just put a few little orange spots here and there along their backs. This will also help them feel um, a little more uh, glowy and under the water. Not a huge amount of work. It's just a little bit of a little bit of time that you take with it, and then in no time you have these amazing, really gorgeous, little spinning around fish which are just a lot of fun to do. And now they're making this, come on, that's just really awesome. And we haven't even put reflections on it. I know. And they're swimming over the bottom of the pond. I dig it. Oh my gosh, I'm almost sorry to see this step in, but it mm -hmm. did. So now we've got to add in some more of the fun details that is going to make this look like just the most serene, perfect water garden escape. In fact, I'm going to give this painting to John so he can build this for me in the backyard because I want exactly this. <laughs> and I want the fish to swirl. <laughs> We're going we'll we'll to put we'll a whirlpool in the center so it forces them to go swim in a circle. No, Swirl. we won't. I don't abuse animals. But I will wish them to. <laughs> All right. Let's come back and we'll add some flowers. So once we have our bottom of the pond and our rocks basically roughed in and our fish in, we can start putting in our reeds. Now I'm going to take a half inch angle brush. This is a very nice brush to have in your art kit. If you don't have this one, you could use a round brush as well, but we're going to make some nice reeds coming up and we're going to be very different in our colors because we really want these reeds to stand out. So I'm actually going to take just my phthalo green and my cad yellow because that will give me these brighter, brighter reeds. And because we use the green and uh, the yellow and black for the other green, it really will create the sense of a different green entirely. I'm going to just take an upward stroke. And I want to fill in this whole space mm -hmm. with some very reed-like, laid-like structures. You can see why I was like, I, I felt like let's not paint, like be too painstaking in this background area mm -hmm. because we're going to have to put so much of this in and, and really quite a lot of this in. Almost all of this will be filled in in this blade work of these irises. And we'll pull some of it out from the background using uh, highlights, mm -hmm. which is some of my favorite. Now, some of these clumps which come in the water are going to be super important because we're going to do some roots and things out of them. Like this guy right here. Curve that over to the right. I'll come back and get that some shading later. Another little curve to the right. So you can see how this particular brush does a nice job of creating those little green angles. Oh, too much yellow. Did you see how much yellow that was? Mm -hmm. I'm going to just very carefully pull that off. That happens sometimes. You get to 
playing and not paying attention and something gets away from you. But don't let it throw you. You're fine. Now, and one of the things that we can do is we can also kind of have a little bent over read there as they sometimes are wont to do. As I come forward, I can get more into my yellow and my green, but I'll be more attentive this time. I'm going to wipe my brush off on a towel because I want to control how light the green is. And if I have too much green pigment on there, I won't be able to lighten it enough with yellow to really get a significant impact. You can see as soon as we start lightening that yellow, it really pops. When I press harder on the brush, it'll make a bigger, wider read. And then when I go lighter, it'll be a finer read. So it can make it seem like it's turning. And while I'm here, I'll go ahead and get a little white and yellow into this mix to just pull some highlights to some of these. Not all of them, just a little bit. I'm going to let this dry for a little second before I continue to work the details forward. And since it's got to kind of rest and dry, I can actually get into a fun thing. I'm going to take some of my yellow back over to my black. And if you guys will remember, this gives us that alternate green that we use. We like so much for the bottom of the pond. Mm -hmm. was not so long ago you might not recall it and we're going to come down here and add some roots and leaves and things that maybe have come below the water this is a nice touch yeah so we are still painting loosely but we're paying attention to the details that help those really do they add that dimension underwater story mm -hmm. I feel like they just are really wonderful. I can get a little of the white into my yellow and black that makes the green. Maybe come along here and make some little careful fine roots that are perhaps a highlighted little area. And that root ball is super interesting there. When we come back and uh, I'm going to get some black and kind of put some black back between the roots just to give it some deep shadow. See how that helps them pop? Now, if my paint is dry enough, I can go back to the business of the green and yellow. Okay. And the green, yellow, and white. If it's not dry enough, I'll have to come in and, you know, really actively dry it. I'm going to turn my canvas just a little bit just so I have some control over what's happening on this leaf. Mm -hmm. Maybe grab one of the highlights. Cluster some of these clumps together important because once you have that you'll have a nice little cluster of what is just genuinely iris leaves 
So we did irises the other way in the previous, and now we're kind of coming back and visiting this again. And maybe exploring this from some new angles. In the brush. What I'm doing here is just making sure that there's some bright highlights in among the greens so we have some green dimensionality. Not that serious. Hmm. It's just a nice thing to do. I can come back in with my round, my number four round. And anything that I want to piece out or control a little bit, I can. Now, I think I want to put some of that leaf beneath the water. So I'm going to take a little of my black and yellow. Kind of. Come back about this far. That way, when I put a little of the water ring around it, it will look like some of that leaf is under the water. How so wild and, and interesting and and fun. Now, if I dry it, I can put in my flowers. But let's make that up as another step so you can just really focus on that because I know sometimes with flowers, that can be frustrating. Um, I'm going to predict, by this video, we'll know it's true, but I'm going to predict that for some, the flowers were super frustrating. So seeing them again in this painting will be like a little irksome, as I mentioned in the beginning, maybe a little bit. So uh, I want to make sure we have a chance to focus on it so you guys don't feel overwhelmed by them. I have changed my water to clean water, and I'm going to use my number four round, but I'm going to give it a good rinse to make sure that I don't have any other pigment on there. I've got my cad yellow here, which is wonderfully bright, but whenever I'm playing with my cad yellow, and I want to have a couple values, I'll add another color to it. Now, normally, I'll add like a cad red to kind of create an orange, and then I build up to the yellow. But actually, these flowers are kind of a green biased yellow. And you might have thought, well, why didn't she get the Naples yellow light, which is totally green biased? I could have, but it's just a little bit light, and these are a little brighter. So I'm going to bring some of my green over to the yellow, and so the dark value of these flowers will just buy us a little bit green. They're super fun, I feel, to do. Because like the other irises, we just paint the shape of the flower. We don't really worry about painting individual petals. It's good to uh, make sure that you do a couple of them that are in bud. I like to do that curved kind of corner stroke for that. Yellow can always be sort of a thing when you're doing it. So you may find... It definitely takes a few coats of color. To really get the effect that you're wanting. I do bigger leaves where the flowers are more in bias for that. But as we mentioned, it's a good idea to put some buds in there. These are these are irises that could be blooming. Soon. Go ahead and a little more green into that yellow. Just really wanting to make sure that those look good. When I do the little green bias yellow this way, and I'll dry between coats, it's going to make the bright yellow here seem much more vibrant and uh, really different than what we normally do with yellow. But if you went orange, it wouldn't look like these irises. It would look like different irises. Mm -hmm being flower specific. So let's dry this with our hair dryer, and then we'll come back and add the highlight.
So once this is dry, you'll be able to get the next layer on. One of the things with acrylic paint, I'm going to take just my cad yellow and mix it in now with my titanium white. I want a bright yellow, but I want it to be just a lighter a little bit than just my pure cad. I'm going to tap it out a couple places. Not everything. I'm not going to cover up everything that I painted. It's also the fact that some of it is bright that helps create that feeling of the flower as well. Right, now we've got dimensionality. If I do want to come back with some pure yellow, I can. But I do like when it's just a bit lighter. And then when that's all done, I can come back with a bit of white. in the center of some of these. Just a few places. And then you just get some very bright, wonderful little yellow flowers that you've just suggested in there. And aren't they cheerful in relationship to these great fish? And they're sort of luminous, and they're also becoming like part of the subject matter of this whole wonderful scene. They really are. Now it's time to start adding the reflections, which is going to make all this just be super wonderful. <laughs> so what is going to give this depth, this drama, is the beginning of reflection. Reflections come in a couple of values, and we've done kind of a simplistic version of this up four. We're going to kind of ample it up a bit. We're going to make it a little more robust, more busy, more about it. I'm still going to use my number four round because I want some control. In the beginnings of my control, I'm going to take a little of my had, uh, my titanium white and my ultramarine blue because they make a nice off-white watercolor to start with. They do good reflections. It does good falls. We've kind of played with this before. We know this is true. And we can start to go through here. Mm -hmm. And very carefully tell the story of water falling down. As it is wont to do. I'm going to turn my surface. It's just because I don't want to get my handle on the white paint here. Mm -hmm. The wet paint, not the white paint. I like the highlights. This is how the water starts to happen. And we start to see the fall coming down. We can't really paint everything because we're, we have to paint what, what's invisible. So give yourself a second to really get into that and think about what you're going to show through this and then what you don't want to show. I'm going to tuck some of that around the stone. I try to think about how the water will flow around the stone. And how I want to put this as it's coming out over other things. There's a little bit. Starting to be a moment there, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Now right here. And even almost create like a little ripple of some water coming out. There it goes down. That earlier work you guys did on the other falls paying off right now big. Mm -hmm. Along this dark line. I'm going to make sure that I've got a little bit of a white line that shows the reflection of that water along the edge.
See how that starts to pull that space as being in the water? Mm -hmm. Tap up and down, engage, and make a little bit of froth right here. It's like bubbles or whatnot coming out. That's looking pretty good. The water line comes through here. And we're not doing, I'm not doing a solid line. I'm doing a very delicate line. We're going to again do the engage and tap out. I will paint kind of carefully around the stem. And let's pour some down here. There we go. Starting to see it happen, aren't you? Mm-hmm. little of my ultramarine blue it's super helpful because the reason i like to do a little ultramarine blue is it does let me come back also with some extra extra highlights and the extra extra highlights are what will make things super duper interesting i'm gonna add some little circles there and then i'm gonna dot around You'll see why those are there in a minute. Because we want some bubbles on the surface of the water. This does have a little water running down it, but it's just in a very thin coat. So we have to kind of barely Im implicate it there. The reflections here are going to be a little different than those over here. Okay. So we're not going to go over here with this. We're going to actually get to kind of a, a version of our base color in reflection. It's really interesting. I'm going to do some curves. It's going to be like a ripple. Like a mud skipper got in here. Mm. And made some ripples. you guys are familiar about how these little reflections start to create surface. You know it. You've been through it. Like if I come right here and I add a little reflection over him, it really puts him under the water, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And that's where he wanted to be. He lives under the water. He doesn't want to be forced to the surface. With the air breathers. Mm. You can see me just making these random reflections. Look at how they go. Ripples in smooth areas. Concentric circles. They all tell a different little story. And I haven't even gotten into my number one monogram liner. I know. We come in here. And if we V in here, then we can tell a story of this water. Maybe having a little bit of that. I love it when the reflections start to go in. Yeah. Around the reed, mm -hmm. kind of in an angle. That's what puts it under the water. Oh, yeah. See how it's sort of an angle and it tucks around the reed? I do. This kind of stuff is fun. And I, and I know these classes are, are big and that everybody is really working hard for them, but, boy, in a short amount of time, you're going to understand how these kind of paintings are done. Plus, these are beautiful to have on the platform. 
No, these are beautiful to have out there where students can do them and they don't have to be behind a paywall. Adding little ripples there. Over here where things are hitting the rocks and it's very energetic, those ripples will be much smaller. Almost little churning little dots. Creating kind of an interesting drama. Come on here. Now some of this I may have to come back with a dark shadow reflection. Mm -hmm. But where I can uh, describe it maybe Without, I will. I, can't, I might be able to come in here and be like, ripple. And then we'll have to come back and put some shadows. It's, it's a whole strange kind of a deal. Mm. I like the ripples. Give ourselves a bit of a bubble. It'll be a bubble when I put in a big bright white highlight. Mm -hmm. Bubbles really kind of come in with shadows and highlights, so you've got to think about them a lot. Where I have solid blue reflections, I will have to come back with a dark shadow and put some reed shapes back through. It is a strange process, but when done, Amazing. Whenever something is swimming in the water, it's important that you have uh, different sizes of reflections. Sometimes they go different directions mm -hmm. because these objects so affect the surface. Now you've got weather, light, shadow, and animals affecting how the water is behaving. And that's important to think about. And even talk about the reflections between the reeds. The more reflections I put in, mm. the more this becomes a pond with depth. It's true. And I know John loves this because this is his favorite kind of thing. It really is. I'm going to bring... Reflection, uh, a little bit of the water line around some reeds. Even though that these are in a uh, deeper shadow, mm -hmm. they'll put some weird little wiggly out reflections. Because the reeds kind of let some light through. Some sunlight comes through sometimes. Mm. We're going to have some real fun here because we're going to come in and paint the reflection in one way and then we'll do a couple like shadows back in. Okay. And that's really, really going to. Show some of what we got. So pretty solid. Come into these edges. Oh God, did I just paint out a rock? I worked real hard to paint. That happens sometimes. That's You'll be working and you're like, did I just paint out something <laughs> I worked hard to put in? Mm -hmm. You're like, yes, I did. That's okay. Make sure that these edges kind of break here. We'll help it. We'll help it work. We'll let it dry for a second while we work some other reflection. Now, a few. Over with the fishes. Over with the fishes. Just a few. The fishies. Yeah. The fishes will have just a few. We don't know what trees are overhead. We don't know 
what's going on. So they'll have some reflections, some some movements, some some of it, but not. The same. Over here, the reflections are a little different and they ripple out. They are, are yellow and black. Interestingly enough, and a lot of white. And that's, we're going to have three values of, of reflection, right? So we're going to have our white and blue, our yellow, black, and white. And then our white, white. And this is what's going to create this drama on the surface of the water. The trick will be to get this kind of reflection right here light enough so that it reads what it is. I'm going to be on the toe of my brush. Mm -hmm. These are very small back here. And I love that there is this two two layers of, of reflection that is happening here. It really tells the story of the shoreline. It does tell a very important story of the shoreline. And it also tells a very important story of light and what is around. So see how those are very different in their yeah. nature, but yet similar? So when you start to observe things like this, that, oh, well, reflections have changed color and even value. They're there. Mm -hmm. Maybe like some are darker and some are lighter. Some have different hues to them. Some might be in shadow. And we're really trying to just speak to a ripple that's happening over there. It's just different than its other friends. I can come out and join with these. There we go. That's pretty good. Mm -hmm. So now we have this different kind of reflection and this other reflection, and the water's pretty active now. And I can take my black and yellow again, really closer to the black. Water is a mirror. Yeah. We're back to water is a mirror. Get the reflections and some things. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to come back and uh, negative space paint it back because it's just too hard to do mm -hmm. the other way. But look at that. Wow. All right. Let's call that a rest and we'll come back and we'll add the highlights that make all of this pop, put some bubbles on the water. If we need to add some like, uh, interestingly enough, some shading to the, to the ripples. I think you guys are going to love it. It's almost done and it's already amazing. So now we're going to go in and add that last bit of frosting, those final highlights that bring it all together. I'm going to get my fluid white paint and my monogram liner, maybe my number four, but probably just my monogram liner involved in this last bit. I'm going to put the fluid paint out here. I don't need that much. I probably didn't even need the amount I put out. And I'm going to come in and find places where I add highlights to the water that I already put out on my landscape. These are kind of energetic lines or dots or things that kind of represent things happening in the water. Mm -hmm. You've got to be a little careful with it because you don't want to put them, you know, where you know there wouldn't be any highlight at all. 
So even in the shadow, sometimes some part of the light will start to pop up. So. I know I always say it, but I get so excited at the highlight stage. You do. You always get excited at the highlight stage. I like the highlights. Now here we have kind of this water buildup back here. Um, that usually comes from that there's a bit of a downward kind of V in the stonework. Mm -hmm. And so the water kind of spills in, collects, and churns back before spilling back out over. No, I have not spent a lot of time looking at ponds of falling water to wonder how does it do that and why? What you'll find when you really start painting, like in earnest, is you stare at everything, like super stare at it and think about it in a, in a deep way and ask yourself these questions a lot. How would I paint that? You know, how would I tell that story? Mm -hmm. Doesn't it just get splashy? Nice little lines going down, helping that transparency be wonderful. Some, but not all, the highlight are along the rock. Mm -hmm. Adding a little bit of churn here. And you see that churn, it just comes to life. Yeah. I love it. The bright sparkles that happen in water are as important as the highlights. Mm -hmm. They're just little places that the water is reflecting back at you, thinking about its choices in life. <laughs> as it flows. As it flows. When I add a little reflection to something like that, it creates a bubble. I like bubbles. Oh, yeah. Because I think there's something that we see in the water a lot. And they're just little touches that we can put in. It brings it a lot to life. That's what we're trying to do is just bring it to life. You know, if I have a little bit of uh, really interesting dots and uh, reflections here, mm -hmm. will help these things seem like what they actually are. It's in little sheets of water that are coming down. So you wouldn't think about this as like necessarily painting loosely. Uh, because there's a lot of information there, but actually we're not getting um, wrapped up in non-necessary details. Oh, yeah. Just creating little reflections shine back. Sometimes at the edge of the water, you can do lots of little straight lines that really demonstrate some energy at the edge of that fall. Yeah. We're not done talking about falls either. You're There's not getting out of this year without really understanding waterfalls. I mean, not that I don't love my 10-minute how to paint a waterfall with the fan brush and one single brush stroke that's so awesome. Mm -hmm. And then add a mermaid tail for another 15 minutes of your time. It is wonderful. Um, but... Being able to understand what waterfalls do and don't do and how they work is uh, it's important if you're going to landscape paint at all because water happens mm -hmm. in landscape. And uh, whether it's a big fall or a small garden one, you have to be able to kind of define some of these.
ripples. Isn't that nice? Oh, yeah. Their perspective of water. It has a perspective. And I'm just finding little highlights that could be Just dancing around there. Dancing around. A little bit like white lining, but we're not white lining. That's not what we're doing. Those white lining skills are useful. Mm -hmm. The highlights. This is going well, my friends. It really is. Very much enjoy capturing not just the fun stuff, the subject matter like the fish, but I love capturing stuff like this water. It just makes me super happy. It's really beautiful. Isn't it gorgeous? Mm -hmm. I've loved how much everyone this 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 year has really appreciated the um, depths of information that we're really getting into. Let's dot around here. It's important to dot light, painting light at all. Um, you want to not just do lines, but some dots. The dots really help it feel like that dappling, that sparkling, that motion. And you really have to bring your painting to the highlight stage to hope to see the water finish. I if feel like you do. You you could really easily get um, discouraged early on mm -hmm. because the water isn't looking like, like what you think it's supposed to look like. But it won't until you get those final highlights in. It, I don't think it even can. Your brain, like, the more they go in there, the more your brain's like, oh, yeah, no, this is a pond. I now see it. And those are fish. And that is, those are flowers. I know where everything is. Yeah, your brain is very much at this stage going, I know what everything is. It's like, this makes sense now. I see it. I see it. The brain is like, I see it. I see the fish. Well, I think that we, we rely on those highlights to put the perspective on things to, you know, to place it in space relative to where we think it should be. We really always do. We forget that. Like when we're painting clouds, we're look we need the perspective in the clouds to put the space above our heads. Or we need these highlights in water, the way sun and wind and light and just everything impacts it. We need that to see it. You know, and not every single highlight on your water has the bright highlights. Mm -hmm. Those aren't everywhere. They're just a lot of places. I feel like I love that little off the edge of the rock now and mm -hmm. suddenly... And that also takes the pond off of the rock, which I think is super fun. Oh, wow. Making sure there's a little run of light into that, into all that. Mm -hmm. I very much like that. I'm going to get into my black and yellow just real quick. And just make sure that I, there's this very important kind of perspective that I have to get here. Mm -hmm. Just make sure that ripple isn't like, that's important to go back and know that you can be like, oh, I can ripple back. Yes, you can ripple back. You can fix your ripple. 
If you need to work on your ripple, you can fix your ripple. See how that's just a little more thought out? Mm -hmm. So you can always come back and get your ripple back going. Always come back and do this. Guess what, John? As sad as I am to say that we're winding in the end, I think I'm going to give myself just this little touch here. Oh, yeah. Just a few more little. Just because I don't want to leave the painting and everybody today because I so enjoyed their time. Sometimes I just will do a little touch or a little something just so that I spend a little more time with you guys, not necessarily because it's super necessary. <laughs> I just want to. Now I've got to decide how to sign this and where I want to sign it. I think I'm going to sign it down here, and I'm going to take this over to my reflection color. I Oh, actually, you know what might be neater? What's that? Is my underwater color. Oh, yeah. So I'm going to take my uh, black and yellow that I had, which is our green in this painting. It's green also. The green golds, which is your cad yellow and your ultramarine and your black and your cad yellow, those green golds, that represents a whole lot of uh, what, like flora and fauna. Not flora, just flora, no fauna. Maybe a sloth. If there's moss on the sloth, just flora out in nature. And it's balancing it against those bright thalos that create some of those green on green pops. I take the time to do these more uh, camos, camouflage signatures because I don't want to undo all the work mm -hmm. that I put in my painting. That's all it is. It's not that I'm not proud of my painting and I don't want people to see that I did it. That's not it at all. I just sometimes don't want this to be everything and become so much more important that um, the painting itself becomes kind of lost in the moment. That looks too bright. It's okay to spend a little time with your signature, right? And think about how it's impacting the artwork. That's okay too. Is allowed. You guys proud of yourselves? I hope you're proud. So Let's look good. at that. Oh, I am at least delivering on the promise of teaching you guys about water and landscape. I can't wait to see these. These are great. These are just, it's just a wonderful collection this year, and I'm super, super proud of it. I cannot wait to see what they do tomorrow. Now, I am trying to, like, pace these where some of these are maybe a little more challenging, and then we give you something maybe a little more mellow, and then we back and forth just to give you some rest so you can, you're sustainable. But remember, if a project is taking you longer, pay attention to how it feels and recognize when you're painting an amount of time that's comfortable and repeatable for you and when you start to feel fatigued, and if you start to feel fatigued, rock back on the amount of time. Maybe break a painting up into segments. It's okay if April goes into May. It's okay if, if it, a, a acrylic April is acrylic August or December. It doesn't really matter when you start this journey. Or if you just came in to learn how to paint some fish in a pond because you're like, I really need that on my wall. It's been a long year, and I, I just need something pretty to look at. All these are good reasons, don't you think, John? I do. I think you guys are amazing. I want you guys to be good to yourselves, be good to each other. Check out the rest of Acrylic April if you haven't. Hit the like and subscribe button. And I want to see you in an easel really soon. Bye-bye.